My name is Kate Russell and today we are going to be discussing a very important issue. A lot of you have got lots of thoughts about it. Digital public services. Now, the digital revolution has changed the way we do everything. Business, banking, travel, shopping, even the way we communicate. And it's also changing the way we access and consume government and public services. But are these changes for the better or for the worse? Well, to help me explore this issue, we have three fantastic guests. We've got Rachel Neiman, who is CEO of Go On UK. We have Robin Christofferson, who is Head of Digital Inclusion at AbilityNet. And Clive Richardson, who is Head of Assisted Digital at the Government Digital Service. I'll start off this discussion, actually, with the first question that we had come in um, through Twitter. And this is from Ian. And it's an interesting one, and one I would imagine that is probably going through a lot of people's heads, um, you know, who perhaps haven't tweeted in even. Ian said, why do we need public services to be digital? What's wrong with the council as it is? The point is about convenience. I think for GDS, we've designed the digital services around the needs of the user, not of the council. So if you want to carry out a transaction after working hours or at the weekend or whenever you have time, so if you're, for example, uh, going to claim carer's allowance, and if you're a carer, um, you're probably, your time is precious to you and you want to kind of do the uh, application for your benefit whenever it suits you, not whenever it suits um, the council or, or the DWP. So I think kind of convenience and being built around the needs of the user is, is the key thing here. Um, it's also worth saying, I'm sure we'll talk about that digital by default doesn't mean digital only and there will always be support to help people do the transaction um, if, they, if they can't do it independently. Robin, you must have sort of, do you have sort of any thoughts on how these services are being made accessible? Um, you know, you obviously AbilityNet does a lot of work in this. Are you finding that the services like GovUK at the moment is getting a lot of views? It's replaced 1,700 separate government websites. Um, and I think by December 2013 had over a half a billion visits. Is, are those numbers as successful as they sound? Are, are, are those portals achieving what they need to from your perspective, Robin? Um, I think it's a work in progress and uh, there's a lot of effort that needs to go in to any website that is an interactive website as opposed to just sort of a, uh, an informational sort of brochure, brochureware website. Um, and no, no websites are more interactive, more um, complex and public sector websites where they're very form driven, very form heavy. And this is a very complicated, you know, it's a challenge, it's a tough ask really. Um, but they are making um, great improvements. You know, it's brought into one place and there is an oversight when it comes to um, consistency and um, reasonable, reasonably good practice, almost best practice approach to um, the sort of consistent and inclusive user experience it's always a journey and even if you launched a website tomorrow that was um strictly you know com compliant to the technical guidelines and had been tested with with disabled users the nature of websites is that they don't stand still so you know what is perfect today might slip and um become problematic in in a week or a month's time so it is an ongoing process um far more effort, attention and consistency has been applied to it than was the case, you know, several years ago. Um, those figures, I'm sure that they are what they are and are incredibly impressive and for many people it is their preferred channel. Um, there will be disabled people in there. There's been a lot of feedback throughout the, the development of the site and all its various uh, areas and elements. And um, it's it is a work in progress and it's by no means you know a perfect experience for many people with with different areas of impairment but it's um 95 percent usable for those people good well that's a you know that's a very good start uh, for a work in progress and i think most things in the world in the world of tech are a work in progress um rachel jane raised an interesting question as well which is does using a computer at work mean you're digitally literate i mean what is your sort of bar for qualification for, for when you pass over that from needing your help to not needing your help? Yeah, um, we've defined what we mean by basic digital skills and those cover three kind of basic areas. So for individuals that is communicating, so whether that's through sending an email or posting on social media um, or whatever, 
uh, transacting, so that's fulfilling a payment online or banking online or uh, doing your shopping online or fulfilling a, a, a public service, as we've talked about, uh, universal credit, for example, uh, then finding information, so knowing how to search the internet, knowing how to sift information, knowing how to understand what is, uh, what is relevant, what is appropriate. Um, underpinning all of that is how to keep yourself safe online, obviously that's critically important. Understanding about personal data, understanding what is a scam, what is a phishing site, uh, and so on, that's phishing with a PH, not with an F. Um, and uh, so we're, we're, we're quite clear about what these, what these, these, um, what the, what the basic bar is. Now we are actually revising those definitions because the digital world is continually developing, and some of those definitions are no longer as uh, as relevant, perhaps as they should be. So watch our website because very soon there will be uh, some revised definitions on that. Now I think that the the word that uh, Jane uses that is particularly interesting here is digitally literate. I think there is a difference between having the mechanical skills to be able to manipulate a digital interface, so to be able to press the uh, press the buttons on your on your computer or swipe the whatever's on your screen on your on your smartphone, and actually having the literacy that means you know when to apply digital to do something more like solving a problem or doing something more creative. So I think there is a difference between the IT skills that you need to manipulate devices and knowing when and how and why you would want to use a digital interface to do something. Got you. So you may know how to use a web browser perfectly well, but have absolutely no clue that you can arrange your doctor's appointment through it. Well, why do you think that, that the huge disabled community that we have is still being sort of overlooked in that respect at, at the core development process? Um, it's estimated at between 80 and 120 billion pounds in the UK. That's the disposable income of the disabled community, which sounds a staggering amount, but it, they are a very large proportion of the of the um, of the overall community. So, 11.2 million people with a registered disability, but there are many, many more with you know age-related conditions that aren't actually registered disabled. Um, people with dyslexia, six million, four million with severe dyslexia. The um, UK, UK population, 25% of the UK population has a sub-14 literacy age. So, you know, there is no such thing as a kind of 80-20, you know, where 80% of the population have got no needs at all. It's a sort of a sliding scale and we all have needs of some kind, even if it's just that on a Friday afternoon, you know, we start to get eye strain and need to, could do with increasing our contrast and text size a little bit. So, um, it's, you know, it's accessibility as a phrase is quite a dangerous one, which implies that it's this additional thing that you do for disabled people and that requires extra budget and extra effort. And because it's a bolt on, then when push comes to shove, it can be dropped off. If we start thinking about inclusive design and digital inclusion is obviously, you know, interlocked with that. If you start thinking about designing things in an inclusive way, then it's obvious, you know, it's a no brainer that you actually build that into all of your thinking, all of your decisions that you make right from the very beginning of a project, and it's not this additional bit that you do over there for those people. So it really is for everybody. And when it comes to mobile computing, and on a daily basis, mobile traffic to any given website is um, more than 50% is coming through mobile browsers. I'm not sure if that applies directly to DirectGov, to Gov UK, but, um, you know, mobile is hugely important and because it's a smaller screen and you're out there on a bright sunny day and there's glare, every every single user, not just people with a disability, every single user is temporarily disabled from time to time because we're now computing on the go in these more extreme environments. You know, if you try to um, operate a website with your thumb balancing your phone in one hand while you're pushing a buggy or whatever, then you know, you're temporarily motor impaired and you could so easily click on the wrong thing if you've got clickable areas that are too small and too close together. Um, you know, if the colour contrast isn't sufficient and you've chosen a, a poor font, then that's going to be really hard for everybody to see under those circumstances. You know, that clarity is required for somebody with a visual impairment 24-7, but everybody's going to be disadvantaged when they're trying to use their a small screen out on the go. And there are so many other parallels like that. You really can't be thinking of 80-20, you've got to be thinking of 
designing for 100% of your audience, um, and that's what digital inclusion is all about. Clive, do you think that um, the work, because obviously you're doing a lot of work at the moment on gov.uk, how is that translating or how much thought is going into the translation of that to the multitude of different screen sizes that we connect to services on mobile devices? Um, yeah, so we've worked hard to make it as accessible as possible. Um, so uh, there's no there's no separate accessibility statement for gov.uk. I mean, as Robin said, we wanted to design by inclusion by default, um, and we wanted to make sure it was more than just ticking all the accessibility requirements that uh, the UK or the EU might be. It's not just a tick box exercise. So whenever gov.uk was being developed, um, we ran a series of uh, user testing sessions for people who had a range of disabilities to observe and understand how visitors with different abilities interacted with the site rather than just kind of red text. Um, so it included people who use screen readers as well as those who use screen magnification, um, uh, keyboard only users, people who use speech recognition, people with dys dyslexia, people with Asperger's and, and autism. So all of that learning was kind of baked into the design. Uh, and as Robin said earlier, in Gov.uk it's never going to be finished. It's a constantly evolving site based on um, on, on, on user research and feedback, um, but we know, I mean, I think it's over a third of people access gov.uk from a mobile device. Mm. Um, it's all compliant, so you can kind of read, you know, there's no, there's no app or anything, it's all just in uh, it, um, easy to access. So we've worked very hard to make sure that the content on there is understandable, legible, and written in plain English and avoids official jargon where possible. That's um, the so, so the content's accessible <laughs> as well as uh, it's actually accessible by a variety of different devices. Yeah, because accessibility, again, you know, we tend to pigeonhole these things, don't we, into sort of like the broad arguments, but accessibility is not just about whether or not you can physically see or access, but also whether you can understand, whether you've got the right, you know, even I have accessibility problems doing my banking during the day because I'm always in the office, so, you know, in some ways that needs to be needs to be taken into account as well. Rachel, do you think as, as much work is happening as needs to be to make sure that the translation from desktop, because obviously gov.uk, they've got it baked into the sort of like the ethos of their, their but gov.uk is not the only public digital service. Are we finding that a lot of um, the desktop sort of services work very well, but then when they translate to, 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 um, to mobile, um, there's some actually some accessibility things built into most of these platforms that get completely overlooked because developers just have no idea. Yeah, um, I was actually at a, at a disability group meeting yesterday, just yesterday, and that, that issue came up that uh, apps quite often, app developers don't really understand the breadth of the accessibility needs and accessibility issues and tend to ignore them when they translate uh, something from the web onto in, into an app. So I think much more there needs to be much more understanding, and probably we need to talk about it in a different way because, as Robin's been saying, this isn't just an add-on for a certain group of people. This is something to enable everybody to have a better user experience. Uh, some people will have greater need for that and others will have a lesser need for that, but it's, it, it's all part of that continuum and part of that spectrum. Is that going to fall within your remit at Go On UK or are you just looking at the sort of, you know, the public consumers rather than the people who are actually building the systems? We're not looking so much at the people who are building the systems, but we're looking primarily at ensuring that all individuals who want to use the internet can do, um, but also at, at small and medium-sized businesses um, and, uh, and sole traders and individuals. So that could be an app developer. And I think part of that then is if you are an app developer working or you're a small business working within the technology field, do you understand the requirements that you need to be putting in place and the standards that you need to be putting in place to provide an optimum experience to others. Okay, we're running kind of close to the end. I want to quickly throw this last question in. Somebody either called Kate or somebody saying, Kate, um, addressing me, how can I get involved in promoting digital skills in my local community? I think that's a great question. Can all three of you give me one tip of what people can do if they want to personally get involved in helping this? Yep, log on to digitalskills.com and sign up and uh, look at what's going on in your area and volunteer yourself as a, as, as a volunteer in that, in your area um, and if you have any further problems, drop me an email. <laughs> Perfect. Robin, how about you? What's your sort of top tip for people who want to help? So yes, if, you're, if you are relatively um, 
conversant in, in IT, then you could either volunteer as an IT for C, uh, IT for communities uh, volunteer if you want to help SMEs and charities, or if you want to go to disabled people and help them in the home, then IT can help is the network for you. Uh, just uh, look at abilitynet.org.uk for the information. Okay. We'll make sure we put links to all of these in the show notes on um, Twitter or anyway, uh, on, on YouTube. Um, Clive, what's your sort of top tip for people who want to get Mine's going to be the same as Rachel, I'm afraid, which is uh, digitalskills.com. So that, that site's been developed by Go On UK in conjunction with, uh, with, with government. Um, but that's the place to both kind of put yourself on the map if you want to kind of help other people as well as post requests. Um, and so working with Go On's partners as well as the other uh, signatories to the government's digital inclusion charter. There's lots of organisations who have national and regional um, reach and you should have a look at that list and get involved with them as well. Perfect, brilliant. And I personally, I've, I've just signed up with STEM, STEM Nets as well um, to start going out into schools and doing um, talks um, and lectures in schools to promote the idea of studying STEM subjects. So there are lots of things that you can do and get involved with and it really does make you feel actually really good too um, as well as being incredibly useful. That's it basically for today. Thank you for joining us as well and thanks to my wonderful guests Rachel, Robin and Clive for sharing their insights um, and of course Thank you for your comments and questions as well. Please do keep them coming in because even after the show, we're still kind of engaging and chatting on that hashtag and that at um, on Twitter. Or you can post on Google+. You can post anywhere. We'll find you. Um, so do please join us next time um, when we will be discussing another subject. It will be in January, so we're, we've got some good things lined up for you. Um, but this is our last show before Christmas, so all that remains for me to do is to wish you all a very, very happy Christmas. Say happy Christmas, my guests. And of course, don't forget to stay connected.